Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon, I'm Larry Jacobs. I am director of the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance and professor at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. I'm pleased to welcome you uh, to Restoring Intellectual Diversity on University Campuses with Ramesh Ponaru and with Vin Weber. This is an inaugural event of conservative voices at the Humphrey School. Uh, it's a new lecture series um, that we will be uh, bringing to you. It highlights conservative, prominent thinkers, public officials on a variety of policy areas uh, who bring a variety of backgrounds. The series serves the center's mission to generate dialogue across differences by stimulating vigorous and civil discussion and debate. All of you will be part of this conversation. Um, for those joining us online, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A button. That's your spot to join us. Uh, click on it, submit your questions. And I'll be honest, I've got a bias towards hard questions, questions that raise things that have not been talked about, maybe disagree with some of the comments that have been made. So please join us, become part of uh, this dialogue that we are having today. Also, if you're joining us and you'd like closed caption, you'll see also the bottom of your screen, there's a closed caption uh, button. Um, Vin Weber and I are very pleased to have with us the Dean of the Humphrey School, uh, Nisha Boshway. Um, she is um, very supportive of this series, very encouraging, um, and we're delighted to have the Dean with us. Since joining the Humphrey School in January, 2022, Dean Boshway has led the school's strategic planning, uh, which singles out among other uh, uh, issues, inclusion and dialogue across differences as one of its core values and guiding principles Thank you so much, Dean Boshway, for being with us. Thank you, Larry. And good afternoon. Uh, welcome to those at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and those who are joining us online. It is my pleasure to introduce the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance's first event in this series, Conservative Voices at the Humphrey School. I am so very thankful to see this program get off the ground as today's event and this series very much aligns with our school's mission and history as we delve into the vital topic of fostering a wider range of ideas and viewpoints. We know that learning is enriched when we have a diverse group of people and ideas representative of our communities, state, nation, and world. Building on the legacy of its namesake, the Humphrey School community aspires to co-create innovative solutions to the world's most complex problems through leadership, service, and inclusive engagement locally and globally. It is critical that we embrace a rich tapestry of people and perspectives, engage in respectful and open discussions, and provide platforms for a multiplicity of voices to be heard. As such, the Humphrey School prepares future generations of students and current professionals to succeed and to lead our multicultural democracy. At the Humphrey School, we value inclusion and dialogue across differences, nurturing a culture and environment where everyone feels welcome and heard. And I'll just say that again, where everyone feels welcome and heard. This event exemplifies our unwavering commitment to stimulating a vibrant and civil discourse across the academic landscape. Today, we are joined by Ramesh Panuru, the editor of the National Review. 
He will share his insights on the importance of diverse perspectives and their role in shaping our society. I'd like to thank former um, Congressman Vin Weber and Professor Larry Jacobs for their leadership and vision for this event series. Today's conversation serves as a testament to our commitment to creating spaces where ideas can be shared, challenged, and refined. Our aim is to provoke meaningful questions, even those hard ones that you wanna type in the chat <laughs> that Larry will get to, foster wide ranging debates and encourage ongoing discussions as students and participants are exposed to differing viewpoints. We at the Humphrey School wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly embrace this ethos, recognizing that a comprehensive academic conversation should encompass a wide spectrum of thoughts and opinions benefiting all members of our community. It is through conversations like these that we challenge our own assumptions, expand our horizons, and cultivate a community that values robust, respectful, and insightful dialogue. So, I invite you to join us on this journey of exploration and discovery as we embrace the richness of diverse perspectives and engage in meaning, meaningful discussions. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Boshway. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, warm, supportive, and um, really uh, wide-ranging uh, welcome. Um, Vin Weber, so great to be here with you. Always. We're, we're, we're at this again. We seem to be uh, drawn to uh, doing these sort of things. Um, just keep conspiring with each other. Yeah, and it's always fun because we get together and Vin's a very smart, interesting uh, person. Um, Ramesh, uh, thanks so much for coming out from DC. Uh, you wrote this piece in the Washington Post. What's your argument? Dive right into it. Uh, but first, let me thank you for, for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I, I'm glad you arranged for good weather uh, while I'm here. Uh, don't, don't invite me to do any December events, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but August is, is just fine. Uh, well, my, my argument uh, in that column was that the lack of intellectual diversity, and particularly the lack of center-right viewpoints in college faculties, um, is a problem. It's a problem for, you know, as a conservative, of course, I would like to see uh, the ideas that uh, uh, I subscribe to get a fair shot at universities, but it's a problem even for non-conservatives. It's a problem for universities themselves, uh, in part because it reduces the necessary public support uh, for universities. Um, it's, it's destructive because it encourages a, an anti-intellectual streak uh, among conservatives that is, uh, that is already too large. Um, and it, uh, it damages liberals by making them less capable of responding to or learning from um, conservative points of view. Uh, and so, so for all these reasons, we need to take that lack of viewpoint diversity seriously. I wanna ask a question, broadly speaking. I mean, uh, university, broadly speaking, has always been thought of as a center left community. I don't mean just this university, I mean universities right. generally. Um, and yet we have, a lot more focus on this issue now than we ever have had before. My question is, are we just coming to grips with it now? Or has there been a change in the way that universities and the academic community think about discourse and issues? Is, is it right. really different now than it was before? Well, uh, you, can, you can find data suggesting that universities leaned left as far back as the Eisenhower uh, years. Um, in my column, I cited some uh, some data from the 19, early 1990s, suggesting a sort of a two to one liberal to conservative ratio uh, in university faculties, which is, of course, 
lopsided, uh, very unrepresentative of uh, the public at large. Um, but later data for, from 20, 2015 or so, I, I believe, um, had it at five to one now. So this is a tendency that has become more pronounced. What you have, it is no longer something you can describe as a liberal tilt. It is more of a kind of ideological monoculture. And simply by being that monoculture, it has different effects and a different kind of character. It is uh, you. It, it, it is experienced um, as a kind of. It can be at least experienced as a kind of orthodoxy, and sometimes as a stultifying orthodoxy, in which people feel less um, able to speak their mind without facing a kind of severe social censure. Uh, and there's been some data on that too. Um, the Cato Institute did some research. Within the, it's done some research over several years, and really, even over the last four years, there's been an increase in the number of people who say, "I feel that I can't express my points of view." Interestingly, it is a, it is a, it is throughout the political spectrum. Conservatives feel it, moderates feel it, liberals feel it. However, there's a political tilt there that the more right you go, the more you feel that way. Um, and uh, when I when I see numbers like that, it seems to me that that they are expressing something. So as I said, one trend here was the monoculture, the sort of the 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 it may be a cascading effect where you start out with a slight bias and it becomes bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. But then there's also been some other changes. Uh, one is the, that there's been this kind of radical expansion of the concept of safety. And so we want students to be safe, not just safe from physical danger, but over time, it has sometimes morphed into safe from being exposed to points of view that offend me, right? Which is obviously a very different concept. But if, if you treat it all as being that same word, safety, mm -hmm. um, it becomes a license for intolerance of other points of view. Yeah, I remember... A couple of years ago, there was a professor at Georgetown Law School that expressed conservative points of view, and the students on campus wanted to establish a crying room where they could feel safe. I thought, really, we've gone somewhere that I can't quite fathom if that's what's what I would never have admitted anything like that when I was that age. I probably still wouldn't. But it's, it's not, it, a, not a formula for psychological not, resilience. No, no, it's really, it's really not. Um, let me ask one additional thing. It, 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 it's not just the numbers, it seems to me, uh, although those numbers are, are in, informative, but the intolerance of anybody reflecting a different point of view. I don't think that was always the case. I think that in, there, there, were, there have been conservative voices on campuses mm -hmm. outnumbered, but certainly there for a long time. Now, as you pointed out, it's not just that they sh there, there shouldn't be so many of them, but they should not be allowed to speak. Right, or, or they don't belong here. They're not. Yeah. They are not uh, uh, part of our community. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know, I've certainly had great left wing professors, uh, yeah. and but they were um, they were fair minded, right? They were they weren't going to give you. They weren't going to grade your papers on the basis of whether you agreed with them, right. for example. Um, and they were going to entertain other points of view. They would they would encourage you to speak up if it was that the kind of classroom where there was a broad ranging classroom discussion. Um, and people don't always feel that way. And it, and I should I should say since I've been concentrating on the faculty, it's not always a faculty uh, driven thing. Sometimes right. it's student driven. Right. 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 So um, you, you're and I just want to clarify this. You're not talking about excluding. You're not saying the left should not be part of university campus if that right. was possible you seem to have a more expansive view of this yeah you know i think i think one of the effects we're seeing of uh the orthodoxy on campus is there is increased um unhappiness uh, uh particularly among conservative politicians and this sometimes um leads to calls for kind of regulation um, and you know you have to be, I think, very, very wary of that kind of thing because you don't want to actually chill uh, free inquiry and uh, academic free speech by having legislation that is that is heavy-handed. Um, and beyond that, the problem can't actually be solved that way anyway. You can't sort of force an overwhelmingly left-wing professor hit to fairly present other points of view. Um, 
So uh, you have to make a conscious effort, I think, to make sure that other points of view are being represented on campus. You didn't say this explicitly, but I'll be helpful. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like some of the legislation we've seen in Florida with Governor DeSantis and Republican administration kind of ex, you know, excluding or barring critical race theory, uh, teaching of or perspectives related to race. Um, and it, it sounds like that's the kind of thing you're saying, that's not the right approach. Yeah, I mean, you know, there may be individual provisions of some of those bills that are, are worth supporting, but overall that can't be the solution that we go. So for. you went to Princeton University, you, you um, a proud graduate. Um, I've been impressed by the uh, by Princeton's uh, James Madison program, mm -hmm. um, and I know you're familiar with it. What is it about that program that you think is a model that other universities might adopt? Well, I think it's a great example of introducing other points of view rather than trying to exclude uh, points of view. They're not there's there's nothing in the Madison program which is about. Um, suppressing left-wing points of view. Uh, and in fact, some of the people who participate in their programs or are affiliated faculty are strong liberals or um, left-wingers, moderates. They don't all have to be conservatives or libertarians, um, but they are people who are all committed to um, a robust intellectual debate. And they, they, they trade in the currency of academia, right? Arguments, reason, logic, evidence. Um, one great example of this uh, is uh, the Robert George, who, who started and still leads the Madison program, spoke up in defense of Peter Singer, the famous utilitarian philosopher who argues that under certain circumstances, it can be right um, to commit infanticide. And Professor George is, is, could not be more on the opposite side of things. He's a very strong pro-lifer. Um, but he said, look, the way to respond to Singer is by, co is by presenting better arguments, not by saying that he can't make his arguments. And, you know, it's interesting looking at what uh, the James Madison program has talked about um, as some of its main concerns, private property, free enterprise. Okay, that, that makes sense. The place of religion um, in public life, but also constitutional separation of powers, checks and balances judicial independence, um, and an agenda that maybe in our own time, some might read and say, wait, that sounds anti-Trump. <laughs> um, so I think this is part of your point that this is a, a commitment to a set of ideas, um, intellectual inquiry, uh, in which rigorous methods and evidence are brought forward, not an ideological or partisan agenda. Right, I mean, it's, it's not a place devoted to the manufacturing of partisan talking points. Uh, or, or really presenting an ideological point of view. Uh, the goal is not to make people um, graduate as conservatives, although there's nothing wrong with that, um, but as people who are capable of thinking through these questions, who understand the conservative argument, even if they don't agree with it. Or maybe, you know, libertarian argument right. or, you know, some sort of... Um, uh, you know, liberal or progressive point of view. I mean, all of that is possibly the, the benefit of creating a space for dialogue and difference. Um, I want to talk about the magazine a little bit because you could argue that the by National the, by Review... the magazine, you mean the National Review? The National Review. You could argue that the National Review led the, the way to the conservative, the conservative intellectual movement of our time. Um, and yet... I, I just wonder, wonder how you are dealing with the fact that on the right, the Trump right, I guess, there's a great intolerance of anybody mm -hmm. that doesn't defend that, that doesn't defend Trump. How, how do you, how do you at the at National Review deal with that phenomenon and find writers and defend writers that, that keep alive and try to advance an intellectual position on the right? Uh, it has been a tricky business. Yeah, boy, I believe. Uh, you know, be, and um, one thing I've found is that uh, Trump himself has been so polarizing, not just in our wider society, but uh, even in my little world, mm -hmm. where um, there are people who are furious at you because um, you're maybe you're anti-Trump, but you're not anti-Trump enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there are people who are furious with you because sometimes you defend Trump, but you don't defend him enough. Uh, and my 
own approach in this has just been to sort of call them as I see them. Uh, and that has led to, you know, sometimes you defend them, sometimes you criticize them. Um, people will sometimes say, oh, you're, you know, are you anti-Trump or anti-anti-Trump? It depends. Yeah, yeah, it depends on the issue. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> I can imagine that it's a difficult uh, situation for you. Larry? Um, so you've laid out an argument that it's the overpopulation of liberals in universities that's led to this decline of intellectual diversity. Is there another possible explanation, which is, is just a supply issue? Mm -hmm. They're just not conservatives going into the academy um, and few conservatives going into, let's say, uh, the study of literature or political science and economics, which are increasingly uh, driven by you know, pretty sophisticated and demanding methods, uh, microeconomics and beyond. Um, and rather, you know, the smart conservative would rather go into business right. where you can make money. So is it a supply issue or is it, you know, kind of these left professors who are kind of hogging the university space? Well, uh, to some degree, these are, are factors that work together. So um, if you think you're not going to be welcome somewhere, maybe you're not going to apply in the first place or you won't do all the hard work it takes. If you think at the end of the day, you're going to be judged unfairly. Uh, I do think there is a, you know, there long has been a uh, lower inclination to join the academy on the part of conservatives. I don't think that can explain this extreme tilt that we see now, or the or the pattern that you know, the more elite the university, um, the uh, the less likely you are to have that kind of intellectual diversity. That I think um, it, it's it's interesting how the argument about this question is very much like the ar argument about affirmative action, but it's in reverse. So um, when liberals see a statistical disparity of groups. In a, in a particular field, they're likely to jump to the phenomenon has to be explained by bias. And conservatives are likely to come up with all these other explanations, that's nah, not bias. Um, and neither one sees this in the other sort of argument. So when, when it comes to the academy, so many um, of the liberal academics who responded to my column and were upset by it basically were saying, you know, it's not, we're not discriminating against conservatives. They're just so dumb. <laughs> you know, um, you know, they don't, they, they, we're not keeping anybody out. They just, they just for some reason don't want to be here. Uh, and you can come up with, with more and more of these sorts of explanations. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, some of them start to look like rationalizations for, um, discrimination. And, and I'll say for conservatives too, you know, there can be such things as unconscious bias. And, you know, we can think when, when we're on the receiving end of it, we can see how that would work in universities, but we too often don't apply it to all the other places there can be unconscious bias. So now we're seeing uh, universities like Princeton and mm -hmm. others who are stepping forward and saying, no, we're, we're going to make a conscious effort uh, to recruit and hire conservatives. So would you expect um, an increase in the pipeline of conservatives? I mean, I th honestly think if you did a search um, in literature mm -hmm. and you know you did do affirmative action by viewpoint, you'd be really hard pressed. It's just not a lot. And I can say in, in the areas that I've run searches, it's just not a lot there. I mean, it's, it's driven yeah. by the academic diversity over methods and theory, which uh, we could talk a lot about that, but it's it's not driven by ideology or viewpoint. It's it's really within the academy um, and these kind of uh, disciplinary uh, debates and discussions. Well, I wouldn't be looking for a radical and rapid um, expansion in the conservative percentage of faculties nationally. Um, but what I would be looking for is consciousness of the problem. Uh, and a lack of complacency uh, and and slow progress. I don't I don't, I don't kid myself that this is this is not a problem that has developed uh, in a short period of time and it won't be solved in a short period of time. See, I thought you were going to make another argument, which is it's not just up to conservatives mm -hmm. that you know intellectuals that you know make up the vast majority of universities ought to be stepping forward in their classes and their research and wrestling in an honest way. Yeah. with 
you know, traditional conservative arguments, Edmund Burke and and others that this isn't just on kind of well, that's that a, a that is that is that is right. And I also think relatedly, um, free speech is not a kind of uh, uh, natural phenomenon. It's a civilizational achievement. Um, it 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 is has to be nurtured, um, and and professors have to go out of their way um, to make it clear that. Uh, that the class is going to be conducted in a way where all points of view are allowed to be expressed and and respected, or at least the people that they're attached to are respected. I, I want to explore that just a little bit further because the other side of the coin, I think, is there do have to be some lines drawn right. about genuinely destructive points of view. You know, I don't want somebody to teach anti-Semitism or what what are other how do you make a differentiation yeah so that you, you do have a free expression of uh, points of view but draw the line against genuinely right. destructive behavior and ideas so um yeah this is this is sort of the core question really when you have any of the controversies over platforming people or over cancel culture and i think the great mistake is to is to think about toleration um mostly as a principle when it's really mostly a disposition. It's a valuable disposition. And I think that the way we, you know, and, and, and applying it to cases requires judgment. It's inescapable. There's no way of getting around the necessity of judgment. But I think that when we make judgments about who is platformed and, and who is canceled and so forth, um, in addition to being mindful of the particular context, right, the, the, the norms that govern uh, a tenured professor are not going to be the same ones that govern the CEO of a company, for example, uh, where the shareholders might have some very practical reasons for not wanting um, that CEO to get involved in controversy one way or another. Um, but I think that that our, whenever there's this co a controversy about somebody having said something or expressed a point of view, and a lot of people are riled up, I think we should ask ourselves, um, can this point of view be held by an intelligent person of goodwill. Not, is this correct? Not, am I offended by it? Um, but not, would I like to see this viewpoint triumph everywhere? But, but can an intelligent person of goodwill sincerely hold this point of view? And it seems to me that on, almost by definition, on every actually controverted um, question uh, in our social and political life, um, all of the answers to those questions can and are held by such people. Uh, and if that's the case, and if we, if we ask ourselves that question and answer it with charity, um, that I think can help us settle a lot of those questions. Now, if somebody is a neo-Nazi, for example, uh, I think we're going, we can reasonably say that is a person of vicious character, right? Uh, this is a point of view that does not need to be heard. Now it's also it also has to be said that it is it is a culturally contextual uh, inquiry that we're in because um, we wouldn't we would not tolerate a speaker now who advocated segregation, right? We because we have made the kind of moral progress in our society where uh, we're the only people who now maintain a need for racial segregation are per persons of vicious character. Would have had a you know in the 1940s we would have had a different set of answers to that. I'm going to just kind of continue down this line. I think it's very important, um, and it really comes to you know which viewpoints do you include? Mm -hmm. And you've been talking about the vicious types. Um, you know there are viewpoints that sometimes um, you know hang out with conservatives or politically conservative. Sometimes you know some of the factions around it. So for instance. I was intrigued by a recent poll that about a third of millennials believe the earth is flat. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay, you know, what's the standard by which we would say, okay, that viewpoint ought to get equal right. time? Or the kind of more politically salient uh, view of the human contribution to global climate change and, and global warming. 97% or so of peer reviewed scientific research and all the important journals says that that's happening. 
Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. There's questions about variability, ocean temperature, and other things. But as to that basic fact, it's accepted. Right. Um, but you know, we've got you know certainly folks in the Republican Party who don't accept it. Now, should that be included because it is kind of a political viewpoint uh, by a major party? Is there, as you said, affirmative action by viewpoint? How do we sort out those sort of questions? Yeah. So. Um... You know, of course, I guess the, the context in which this might come up is, let's say you have a professor in one of the scientific disciplines who is an outlier on that question, uh, or, you know, or at least is um, maybe says uh, anthropogenic climate change is not likely to have catastrophic effects, for example. Um, I, th I think the answer to that question, if, if, if this person is again, sort of conducting himself in the currency of academia. You know, if he's offering arguments, um, even if they're maddening or frustrating arguments um, that most of his peers think are wrong, uh, I think you know, if this person is up before the tenure committee, you judge him by the quality of the publications um, and the, sort of the normal criteria. You don't put a thumb on the scale against him because of that. At the same time, if he is just a crank, if he can't, meet those standards, um, that's a totally different question, it seems to me. I don't want, um, yeah, I mean, it's it sort of, you know, I don't think you're going to be able to find the flat earther uh, who can, uh, uh, who can, who can meet the, the test in ge geology, for example. Well, I, I certainly uh, would hope that would be the process uh, with, the, in terms of uh, tenure and promotion. Um, but we get lots of requests here at the Humphrey School for different points of view to be brought in and given the platform. And, you know, to be honest with you, my, my viewpoint about that is, is there credible evidence? Mm -hmm. um, is there some sort of body of research that would, that would provide support for that? And, and I've struggled with the, you know, the human contribution of global climate change, because it looks to me when I look at the vast amount of research, it's a topic that is really you know, it, it, it's been decided by, by credible researchers, again, with the very important caveat that there are differences about variations and about um, the, the vagarities of ocean uh, temperatures and other sort of minor issues. Am I, am I off on this? Am I being intolerant? Um, I would say it is not. So let's say you had a politician coming to speak who was... Um, uh, a vocal opponent of the idea that humans are contributing in an important way to the warming of the planet. Um, I don't think it would be right to exclude that person um, because of that point of view. I think it would be perfectly fine to, you know, hold up signs in protest, to ask pointed questions, um, to force them to to answer hard questions about you know why is the why is there's this overwhelming scientific consensus against you uh, how do you um, uh, deal with you know all of this evidence um, but no I I wouldn't exclude such a person it seems to me that we just, just to stay on climate for one more minute that the real that there is an intolerance on the left on on that subject as well because. I agree with Larry, the, the preponderance of evidence is that there's, that human activity is contributing to climate change. But that does not necessarily lead to the conclusion that you should ban power mowers. Right. I mean, and, and, and yet every proposal that comes down to combat climate change is if, you, if you're against it or question it, you are put in the category of a climate denier. Right. And that's an intolerance too, because with all the strategies that we've been pursuing may not work. Yeah, no, and I, I agree with that. And I, I don't, in fact, support most of the proposals that people make to combat climate change. Thanks for all of you who've been adding questions. I'll be collecting questions from folks uh, here as well in a moment. Um, uh, but let me get to some of the questions that have already been submitted. How do you distinguish between conservative voices and pressure to maintain the status quo uh, culturally and politically, that leads to discrimination against women in science. Uh, would the adding of conservative voices contribute to the persistence of that? Uh, interesting question. I would say um, not necessarily, and it shouldn't. I mean, our being alive 
uh, to one form of bias should not make us blind to all other forms of bias. And I'm, you know, all in favor of, of uh, conservative female physicists being able to, uh, uh, to, to get the jobs that they deserve. Do you think religion ought to be playing a larger role um, in, in universities uh, as part of its public life? This has been, you know, this one of the trends you've defined it in terms of ideology, liberal conservative, but there's also been this tension about secular versus religious. Is that something that we ought to be talking about? Well, I do well? think that there's a closely related phenomenon of bias there that I, I suspect that uh, even your uh, kind of a superstar academic when he's applying for a job, if, if that academic happens to be an evangelical Christian, is probably not, is probably taking some pains to downplay that aspect of his identity. Um, we've got other questions here. This is, that's been one of the ones that keeps coming up. Um, what schools do you think are excelling at welcoming intellectual diversity? We've talked about Princeton. Yeah. Are there other places? Well, you I, think, say? I think the University of Chicago's free speech principles are uh, are something um, worthy of emulation and, in fact, that have been emulated. Uh, and I think that there are some encouraging signs here and there uh, all the time that um, university administrations, in many cases, uh, have uh, have decided that that they do need to speak up for a culture of discussion and debate. And just to be clear about that, because you mentioned Chicago, uh, we've seen this at Stanford and elsewhere. This isn't kind of, um, you know, a, a quiet, demure sort of uh, exercise. Uh, often these statements are coming out in the context of very heated controversy right. in which, right. you know, you have presidents and deans standing up to students and saying, I realize you feel strongly about that, but, you know, your sense of being hurt or you know, the microaggressions that you're sensing cannot override the larger right. uh, protection for speech and dissent and for posing critical questions. Yeah, that's right. Of course, at Stanford, it was the shameful treatment of Judge Duncan um, when he was supposed to be able to speak there and that it ended up not being <laughs> an intellectual exchange of any kind. And the administration did say, you know, this is this is not appropriate, this is not the way. Um, that uh, that we treat opposing points of view here, um, which I think was uh, was very important. Yeah, but just to get to that issue, because I think that was very pointed. Yeah. You had a number of students saying that being in the room was a harmful experience. Right. And um, I, what I'm hearing you say is there is a trade off here, and that the value of the 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 speech overrides the sense of a group that it's harmful to them. Yeah, you know, somebody, um, one of the earlier controversies um, at Yale, uh, I think it was over something completely ridiculous, like people's Halloween costumes, and um, and there was a student quoted saying, you know, people talk about all of this free debate, but this is our home, you know, and it needs to be a welcoming place for us. And that's, that's right. I mean, you know, while you're here, certainly it is your home, um, but it's a particular kind of home. It's... <laughs> It's an enterprise that is dedicated to, you know, construction, obviously, but also to intellectual inquiry. This left, is not left wing protesters are trying to drown me out. Yeah, yeah. Well, this brings up a, a, a difficulty in dealing with the, the question of, of intellectual diversity on campuses because the problems you just guys were just discussing were not caused by left-wing faculty members. They were right. caused by the student body. Yeah. The customers, if you will. How do you how do we how do you cope with that? And not always, you know, sort of all of the students, no, no but no. the ones who are who are most intolerant and most willing to to try to silence other right. people. Right. Which is why I was, you know, I was saying it's not free speech isn't a natural phenomenon and it it has to actually be stood up That's for. A good point. And, and a culture of free speech, you know, and the courts are, you know, the law of free speech is, is very important, and, but, it, but at a university, you need more than that. And this is, this is not a, uh, a, a kind of gentle exercise. I mean, speech has always been recognized at times as being, you know, vigorous and contested and controversial. And I, I say that because I think maybe some people listening are thinking, 
yeah, these are important points, but there's a fire to this. There's a heat mm -hmm. to this. There's a, you know, a real sense of, uh, of kind of primal importance uh, to a perspective that's not being expressed, that is being expressed. Right. And um, it strikes me, it's precisely in those contexts that you need institutions with clearly articulated principles around speech, around dissent. And at the same time, civility doesn't mean you have to be milk toast, right? You can take very strong points of view and advance them forcefully um, while also respecting other people's right to express different points of view. We have a lot of questions here from folks here and, and online about uh, what does conservative mean today? Um, yeah. And the reference is, okay, you've had <clears throat> people who advertise, advertise themselves as conservative Republicans, but in the recent era, they've, they've advocated defaulting on the U.S. debt. They have raised questions or made arguments for terminating parts of the Constitution. And, you know, the list goes on. Um, how do you, you know, give, what is the conservative, um, you know, viewpoint at today? Yeah. So uh, conservatism is a, is a house with many mansions uh, and uh, uh, they don't always have connecting doors as we're finding out. Um, when I think about my own conservatism, I think of it uh, as first starting with um, gratitude for all of the, the good things in our lives and our society that we haven't been responsible for ourselves and that we need to preserve and build on. Uh, and in our country in particular, I think, of, I think of an American conservatism, I think an American conservatism worthy of the name has to be about conserving our political inheritance from the founders. Um, you know, a, a constitutionally bound free society, um, the task of conservation doesn't mean, as you know, Burke acknowledges, doesn't mean you never change. Um, it's not uh, it's not merely passive, but but requires great activity. You to protect any achievement, both from internal decay uh, and external attack. Uh, and and I think that conservatism is constantly should constantly be engaged on on a multitude of fronts in fighting that battle. I'm a reader of your columns, um, so I feel like I've got some familiarity where. Uh, where you've taken strong positions, pro and frankly critical of uh, some of the Republican uh, policies um, and what's going on with the campaign trails. Here's a question from one of our friends here. Is there a path through the disinformation and conspiracy theories that dominate a lot of conservative thought today? Yeah, it's. I think it's a golden age we're living through for conspiracy <laughs> theory. Uh, and uh, and the, the thing I've, I've noticed... Um, about them is if you believe in one conspiracy theory, it's never just the one. It's you've got to collect them all. Yeah. Um, interestingly, the guy uh, I just found this I found this out when I was writing something about conspiracy theories a couple of years ago. Um, the guy who came up with the term sheeple, you know, wake up sheeple, believed every stupid conspiracy that you could possibly imagine, and uh, and then some you you wouldn't imagine. Um, I think that, you know, if I think about the recent changes in conservatism uh, under Trump, uh, the increased, uh, the, the larger protectionist wing in the Republican Party, I'm not for it. Uh, I tend, uh, in most circumstances, to be in favor of free trade. But that sort of thing doesn't bother me as much as the incredible a uh, torrent of conspiracy theorizing, um, often led by Trump himself. That, it seems to me, was that was something that I had thought had been successfully marginalized within conservatism by William F. Buckley Jr. Right. when he very carefully but forcefully drove the Birchers out of the movement. And all of that, that style of thinking, unfortunately, has come back. And it's simply, I mean, I think it just simply has to be fought. We've been talking about uh, intellectual diversity um, on university campuses, but we haven't talked much about uh, the uh, colleges with Christian affiliations. Right. Should there be intellectual diversity um, at Baptist and Catholic colleges? Yeah. So... Um, I do think that it is, it is, you have a special case 
when you have a college with a particular religious mission, um, as opposed, you know, when it reflects that mission, as opposed to a university that says it's devoted to free and unbounded inquiry, but then just happens to be a kind of bastion of a particular kind of political orthodoxy. Um, I don't mind having a landscape in which there are many different kinds of colleges. I would say that the Baptist University or the Catholic University needs for the good of its students to be able to expose its students to other points of view fairly. Um, and, uh, and, and in, you know, in practice, I think that's going to be, uh, that is going to, that is going to take more of an effort, not less of one at such an institution. Um, we've been making the argument or discussing the argument that, um, progressive ideas are overrepresented in universities. Mm -hmm. Question from one of our friends online, is it possible that progressive thinking is simply more compatible with a world that is changing as rapidly as ours is today? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, look, I mean, like progressives obviously tend to tend to think that, right? Um, but uh, you, one could, I think, just as easily say that um, in a world that's rapidly changing, it's even more important to hew to certain timeless principles um, for example, having to do with uh, with human rights and uh, and limited government. So no, I don't I don't think that uh, um, the mere fact of social change sort of uh, if, makes the case for progressivism. If that were the case, Larry's question, yeah. the polling would show that progressives are happier people. Mm. It's exactly the opposite. That's some of the most interesting polling you can look at is there is a divide between people on the right and people on the left in terms of their sense of well-being, sense of are they happy with life, and the people on the left are less happy. So I, it, I, I think that rebuts the argument. But yeah, and everybody's getting less happy. Yeah, that's also. right. That's it's right. the other fighting. Certainly well. the world isn't getting happier. Yeah. So there are different ways in which you can set up uh, and encourage intellectual diversity on campuses, particularly with regards to conservative viewpoints. Um, question here from a friend uh, with us today saying, should universities look to the Hoover Institute at Stanford as a model because it creates a rallying point for conservatives on campus? We talked earlier yeah. about the Madison Project, which doesn't follow that. It's more open and there's a range of, of perspectives and it's not ideologically a rallying point. Well, I think, I think uh, there have been a lot of great scholars affiliated with Hoover. Um, I think the Madison program has had more of an impact on the culture of the campus because it's tried to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the Hoover Institution has, uh, I think, really tr have tried to be a kind of enclave of, of a certain kind of thought, um, but hasn't really been about the business of changing the culture of, uh, of the campus. And I think, you know, that's needed. Um, at the University of Money, there's a great deal of focus and money spent on uh, diversity in terms of race um, and gender and sexual orientation. Are you aware of any current push for um, diversity initiatives um, to uh, include diversity of thought, intellectual yeah. diversity? Is that happening? I think the main way it's happening is through the creation of these centers that may not be explicitly conservative, but are open to conservatives. I've seen it at the at Arizona State University, uh, for example, um, particularly under the during the governorship of, of Doug Ducey, he really tried to create a bipartisan board that where people would be devoted to this inquiry. I went there uh, and spoke. I was up. Um, I was talking with David Leonhardt from the New York Times, uh, a, a terrific liberal commentator. Um, and, and I think that that is a successful model that is being replicated and should be replicated more. Um, from the perspective of a university president or dean, um, who's maybe looking at this whole area of speech thinking, that looks pretty, uh, flamboyant. Mm. <laughs> you, you get in, got involved in these debates and you could end up in the New York times or front page of the story. And, you know, it's understandable why you wouldn't be necessarily inclined to head that direction. Do you think, though, that there's an argument about institutional protection for a dean or president to step in, like like Princeton and Chicago, yeah. and now 
you know, after its unfortunate incidents we've seen at Stanford, is there a case for basically inoculation? Well, first, I mean, I just think it's part of doing your job, right? I mean, to to reaffirm what a university should be should be for. Uh, but I also think, and, and I alluded to this at the beginning, I, I do think we have seen a real drop off in public support, particularly among conservatives for universities. Um, and I think that that's dangerous. I think universities are very important institutions in the life of our society. Uh, and if we get to a point where conservatives you know, don't want to support them, don't want to donate to them, um, don't want tax dollars going to them, possibly even want to regulate them into submission, um, that would be, I think, very bad. Uh, and, it's, and it is one reason, uh, one additional reason, why I think that university leadership should be mindful of the problem. One trend that, that brings to mind is, and this is not just on the right, but we're increasingly hearing serious people question the value of a, of a college education at all arguing instead for some combination of technical institutes and apprenticeships. Um, at one level, that makes sense. You can get good jobs doing that. But does, does, is, that a, is that trend threatening uh, to you? I, I'm, I'm for that trend in general. Um, I, I think it is a mistake to tell uh, people, you know, you have to go to a university, you have to get a college degree, and if you're not, you're a loser, mm -hmm. um, and you're never going to amount to anything. Um, that I, I think that's been a, that's been a destructive message, and so I think it's it's important to, for there to be many pathways to success um, in our society. And I do think that we have um, neglected uh, creating those pathways for people who are not uh, who maybe are not getting the college degree, or at least are not taking the conventional route um, yeah. to that college degree. So I, I don't mind that. I do think it sometimes can spill over into uh, denigration of you know, colleges and the life of the mind um, that, uh, that I, I, I don't think makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking a moment ago about the commitment on most university campuses to diversity with regards to race and gender. And, um, these are things that you can see usually, um, but you can't see a political perspective or viewpoint. Should universities be asking candidates for their political viewpoints so that can be incorporated into hiring? Uh, well, I think that if you ask people about their political viewpoints, a lot of people would feel pressure to mask some of them or, or downplay them in the, in the current context. You know, I think that um, uh, the fields that we're really, that I think we should be particularly concerned about, say, you know, politics, history, so forth, um, the, you're going to have a sense of the viewpoints from the published work of a lot of people or from the academic work that people have done. And what you really need to, do, to be doing is A, not holding it against them that they have conservative points of view, but B, I, I mean, I think seeking out people. Why is it that, you know, nobody in the last 10 years that we've looked at has been a conservative, for example? You know, I, I'm going to express a little skepticism about that. I think you know, I think of searches I've been on in American politics for Congress positions or presidency. It's so entirely focused on theories that are grounded in uh, the scholarship or methods that come out of economics um, uh, that the political viewpoint, if it's there, it's, it's, it's tertiary. It, it's mm -hmm. not really, it's it, 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 serious scholars uh, that are publishing in the top journals that are right. peer reviews, this is not a platform for articulating a perspective. I, I mean, I, I think Well, to the focus on methods can sometimes be a screen. For, so, I mean, like if you're a student of Harvey Mansfield in politics, for example, you're not going to be a quant head, you know? So, so um, we should be mindful of that kind of effect as yeah, well. I think you're in, I think you're in thin ice there because yeah. I think there are plenty of qualitatively oriented um, historians and political scientists and sociologists who are some of the most progressive socialist, you know, uh, academics out there. Um, I just think it, you know, when, well, once you need to look at the pipeline, too. once you kind of go into this pool yeah. of who's applying, I don't think there's a, a kind of a marker that would be equivalent to um, race and gender. Um, I just think it's, 
it's more dicey and you combine it with the issue we talked earlier about, about pipeline. I think it's. What would your advice be if I could turn the tables? If you're a, to, That's not fair. To a conservative grad student who wants to make a career in academia. How, how would you, would you tell that person, um, you know, she should be totally upfront about her point of view? I, my, my advice would be you want to publish in the best journals and, and with the best university presses possible, and then uh, look to write opinion pieces that would say, based on my research or my analysis of existing research would lead me to these conclusions. And the Washington Post for many years, and I think it's coming back at something called the monkey cage. Um, and there you would see scholars you know, leveraging their own research or that of others to apply it to uh, contemporary current uh, debates. That would be my suggestion, because I think all you know, credible uh, faculty search committees are first going to go to the the norms and the practices that we are trained in, and that we we face all the time as we try to get publications. And if if her research was on um, the efficacy of building more prisons and uh, hiring more police as a means of, of combating crime, you wouldn't say, well, that that maybe do something else. I think if the methods are strong. I mean, you know, for instance, you know, that sort of, if I had a PhD candidate who was working in that, I would say, okay, you're, you're, you're going against the, the current here. Identify what the, the, the kind of competing theories are um, and then make it clear. This is what the current theory is. I'm going to be presenting evidence that has not been used before. And here are my findings. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to have a section that's like the mea culpa. I realized that I wasn't able to answer all these questions and legitimate, you know, questions can be raised about what I've done. I don't, I don't think, you know, there's a kind of, for most faculty, there's a kind of the ideological um, uh, bar. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that there isn't an ideological tilt. That I agree with you, but I, I do think it's a more complicated story as to how we've gotten to the five to one ratio that you've talked about. Uh, maybe, but I also suspect that uh, you may be charitably assuming that more people are like you than there are. <laughs> Isn't everyone like yeah. us? <laughs> uh, okay, I've got a couple more questions here, um, uh, and we'll be wrapping up soon. Um, this question from one of our friends online uh, said, what about doctors mm -hmm. um, who are conducting research um, and may be unpopular? Um, at a time. This happened during COVID. We had, you know, quite a bit of, you know, differing research going on, particularly at the beginning, but it's part of the, the scientific method that people, yeah. you know, have differing findings. Um, does that lead to, uh, you know, some of the same issues of kind of the lack of free speech, of the kind of punishment for those who are finding um, results that are unpopular? Yeah, well, I mean, this gets into a much larger discussion uh, uh, that's important and, and I think fascinating actually about the role of science in our culture, mm -hmm. uh, which I think we saw particularly during COVID, where we are we sort of demand a, a kind of oracular function be played. We want science to give us answers that science, by its nature, can't actually give us. Um, uh, you know, and I think we had this whole thing about following the science. It was well, the science actually. The science doesn't tell us how to make a trade-off um, yeah. between, you know, health and other goods, uh, for example. Um, I think that 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 kind of sort of dysfunctional cultural attitude towards science ends up posing a threat to medicine uh, in in a lot of different ways, and I think that we are seeing um, not just sort of uh, attacks on science uh, from the left and the right, but also attempts to, in medical schools, um, make them put political missions more front and center. Uh, and I think it, it's it's something worth there, there's fighting. A, there's quite a bit of discussion yeah. now about CDC's public communications mm -hmm. and the failure to articulate uncertainties uh, because people read their their kind of public advisories and took them as you know, this is the gospel. And yeah, so, well, I mean, there's all kinds of problems. There's also just this ridiculous degree of, of risk aversion at CDC. This is a group, this is a group 
but doesn't believe that you should ever order your steak medium, right? I mean, the official CDC recommendation is it needs to be well done. You know? But that that is a mindset that spills over into a lot of areas. Well, I want to apologize yeah. for serving you rare steak last night. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to just wrap up here with a few uh, final comments. First, upcoming events. Um, we've got a terrific program tomorrow at 11. Should U.S. elections be nonpartisan? Uh, Rebecca Green is joining us, um, a noted uh, legal scholar who will be talking about the history in the U.S. of relying on rival uh, partisan actors in elections. Um, then we have another of the series of conservative voices coming up on Monday, September 25th. We'll be joined by Amy Gadara, who is the Secretary of Education of Virginia and has been one of the leaders in the parental rights movement, um, and she will be our next guest. And a Minnesota and a Minnesota, yes. Um, there will be a video of this uh, conversation. It'll be posted in about a day or two. It'll also be out in the podcast form. So whatever you rely on, we're going to help you. Um, if you've enjoyed this event, please consider giving a donation. Um, as I mentioned, our dean is here, and she'll be grateful, and um, she'll let me know that. Um, <laughs> I also want to let you know that uh, we are grateful to the construction workers out front who were doing their job, um, but kindly uh, took a break uh, so that we could finish this program. Warm thank you, Ramesh Punaru and Vin Weber for this great conversation and to all of you for joining us. Yes. Thank you.